morning will come from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped with every good work. And he was looking at Romans 8, 9. Romans 8, 9. I don't have the mic on, do I? Thank you. I'm so used to not wanting to hear me that I turned it off. Which reads, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. This brother said that he prayed for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit every day. He prayed that the Holy Spirit would come into him every day. Now he's asking for the third person of the Godhead to enter his body, which would have made him incarnate. There's only been one being who was ever incarnate, and that's Jesus the Christ. John 1.14 When I asked him what his authority was for praying that, he said, look at Luke 11.13. So let's do that. Luke eleven thirteen. If ye then be evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? This passage says that children of God could ask God for something. It doesn't say that a sinner could. But it doesn't tell you the whole story either. If Romans 8 9 says, when I don't have the Spirit, I'm none of His, how do I pray for the Spirit if I'm none of His? Can't do it. And so I asked him about that. I said, you asked Him to come into your body every day and you're none of His? He misunderstood Romans 8 9, which is in a context of how we follow Christ. And that's through verses, chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Look at it, Romans 8. This tells you how your Spirit dwells in you. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh. Now that's not my body he's talking about. He's talking about when he lived under the law of Moses. Romans 7, 5, he says, when I was in the flesh. Well, he was in his actual body when he wrote that. He doesn't mean that. In Romans, when you read the word flesh, just substitute the law of Moses. That's what he's talking about. He said, we don't walk after the law of Moses, but after the Spirit. Now, how do I do that, Paul? Look at verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the wages of sin. That's the law of sin and death. You sin, you're dead. You can't stay in sin and be alive to Christ. Why did it have to be the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus? You look at verse 3. For what the law, that's the law of Moses, could not do. The blood of bulls and goats could not take away my sin. So what does it mean that he's praying for the Holy Spirit when he's none of his? It may make no sense to me at all. But what he should have done is seen the cross reference in Matthew 7, 11. What am I asking God for when I'm praying for the Holy Spirit? Matthew 7, 11. But you... S well, I've got Mark 7, 11. That won't work. Is Matthew in the New Testament... I should have remembered that. We have stores in the Memphis called 7-Eleven. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts. This is the cross-reference to Luke 11, 13. Unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things? Joy, peace, love. All of that is the fruit of the Holy Spirit, not the Holy Spirit Himself. Ever. On the day of Pentecost, if you'll look at Acts 2, 16 and 17 with me, a promise that Joel the prophet made in the long ago, about the 8th century B.C., came to pass. In fact, Peter said, this is that spoken by the prophet Joel. 
It shall come to pass in the last days that I will pour, now read this carefully with me, out of my spirit. Please underline the words out of. It's the little, it's one word in the Greek, it's a preposition. A, I'll just anglicize it, A-P-O. It's pronounced a pa, it means away from. They were not promised the person of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. They were promised the power of the Spirit, Luke 24, 49. They were promised that that power would enable them to do some things that other folks could never have done. But that power was poured away from His Spirit, not the Spirit Himself. The Spirit Himself is a being as we've already examined in the last lesson. What I want to show you today is that the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit and the Word are said to do the same things. And that is an interesting study from the standpoint of telling us how the Holy Spirit activates, how He works, and in my view, He's very active. I don't think He's staying inside of me and hibernating and not doing anything. I detest that doctrine because it says He's not doing anything. Or they say something like, I don't know what He's doing, but I guess it's all right. He is active, folks, and He's active through a seed. Next time you plant a seed in the ground, you tell me how it grew. That's how it's done. And the seed is the Word of God. Luke 8, 11. And so when that message is planted, Holy Spirit goes to work. That's His tool. In fact, we're told that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Ephesians 6, 17. Notice this passage in Nehemiah 9, 20 and 30. Nehemiah said, you gave your good spirit to instruct them. Now we might stop there and say, see, directly done. No, it wasn't. Not even in those times. You might say, well, how did he do that? Verse 30 tells us. Yet many years didst thou forbear them, and testified against them by thy spirit. How, Nehemiah, in thy prophets. That's always the way it is. Peter said Christ preached to the souls in prison, that is, those who were evil during the days before the flood. How did Christ do that? 2 Peter 2, 4, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Always it's the case that no angel, no spirit preaches to men. You remember when Philip was told to go join himself to the chariot? He was told by an angel, there's a man riding over there. He was told by the spirit, there's a man riding over there. But the preacher had to go. The human vessel that contains the message had to go to Philip as he rode in his chariot. That's how God does it. Our young brother just read a moment ago about something Paul said to Timothy. He said, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, and that from a child thou hast known the Old Testament, the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto the salvation which is in Christ Jesus. You want to know why Christ came, from whence He came, why He had to come? Read the Old Testament. It's His story. It's His family album. He's in every book of the Old Testament. He's the seed of woman of Genesis. He's the Passover lamb of Exodus. He's the high priest of Leviticus. He's the rock and horror of Numbers. And He's the prophet like unto Moses in Deuteronomy. Everywhere you read from Genesis to Malachi, you'll find the Christ or a reference to Him or to His family or to His seed line. It's all about Him. And Timothy, you've been studying those scriptures all of your life. They've made you wise unto the salvation which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by, let's underline that word inspiration. It's one word in the Greek, thao, God, neustos, breathe. That's important, brothers and sisters. This message that we read is living, active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This is a living message. How living? Look at Romans 10, 17 with me. We quote this verse all the time. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of Christ, or God. Christ in the American Standard Version. Let me underline that word, word. The Greeks had two words for word. Well, at least two, there's more, but in the Bible. There was the word L-O-G-O-S, logos. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But the word here in Romans 10, 17 is not logos. 
It's R-A-M-A. Chrema. Why Chrema? Well, look at Ephesians 6, 17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Chrema, Word of God. Why am I saying that word? Because that word means God-breathed word. God's word has God's breath in it. That's important. All scripture is God-breathed. I wrote a book with that title, The Scripture God-Breathed. In fact, it's three books in one. Because that's what we have here. Why is that important? Pile of dust on the ground. And God breathed into that dust, and man became a living soul. God's breath made the dust come alive. This message is different from any other message in the world. It has God's living breath in it. It's activated by the Holy Spirit. It's His seed. It's His sword. It's how He does it. You can't find a Christian anywhere where the gospel has not gone. And if it were the case that the Holy Spirit did it directly, then why should we go? Why should we go? That verse there that the young man read is very important for us. We quote it all the time. We need to take a long look at it. Because when we get through, we are furnished unto how many good works? Now, if I'm furnished unto every good works through the Scriptures, what else is there? I believe in the all-sufficiency of the Word of God. Amen. I'm not asking God for anything extra. And I'm trying to study to show myself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, handling aright the Word of Truth, American Standard Version. I want to know the Scriptures. I don't want to appear before God one day and say to Him, well, I didn't know that was in there. I won't tell Him that, because He's going to tell me, I'm disappointed in you, Keith, and I don't want to hear that either. After all, it took a lot to give me this message, and I need to know what it is. Look at 1 Peter 1. We talk about the new birth in the first session. Peter tells us here how it's done. Seeing ye have purifies your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit, his teaching, unto unpretended love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Verse 25, this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Rob, why do you go out and have Bible studies? If he's going to do it to you directly, don't need to go, brother. Jesus said, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. How are you born of the water? You're baptized. How are you born of the Spirit? You follow what he said to do. Amen. It's that simple. So you're born of the water and of the Spirit. By the Word of God. That's how He does it, according to that passage. Look at Psalm 119.50. The Word and the Spirit make us come alive. I like that. I like to be alive, don't you, Hugh? Enjoy life. Even cutting down trees is fun. Huh? You don't cut them down, though, do you? No. Just pile them up. Psalm 119.50. This is my, my comfort and my affliction. Watch this. Incidentally, Psalm 119 is a royal praise of the Word of God. Every verse in it has something about the Word. It's a great psalm to look at. It's divided into 22 sections, all of which are headed by one letter from the Hebrew alphabet. In the, is the Spirit that quickeneth. But well, watch this now, fellows. If I stop, girls, fellows and girls, huh? It is the Spirit that quickeneth. If I stop there, I'd say, see, the Holy Spirit did it directly. But He tells us how in the rest of the verse. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The Holy Spirit and the Word of God teach. The Calvinist loves to use John 6, 44, but he doesn't quote verse 45. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. And the Calvinist says, see, the Holy Spirit has to work on your heart somehow to draw you to Christ. Oh, but we're told in the next verse how that's done. Every man that therefore hath heard and hath learned of the Father. Why? He's taught of God. That's how the Holy Spirit teach, does it. He teaches us through His message. 
And he is one who can teach. Both he and the Word are said to do the very same things. There's a reason for that. The Word and the Spirit convict us. That was his job when he came to earth. John 16, 8. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine to exhort and convict. This is a charge to elders. But it's said that he knows the word, therefore able to convict. The word of God convicts me. Have you ever been reading the Bible? And all of a sudden you thought, I better get busy on that one. Or I never read that before. Or I need to start doing that. John 16, 8, And when he was come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. That's his job. How does he do it? Well, it says that the Word does it. Therefore, that's how the Spirit does it. The Holy Spirit and the Word comfort. The early church gathered, and they had the persecution of this church had begun. And for a while, there was a peaceful period before it really picked up again. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, and were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit were multiplied. What a marvelous time that was when he, direct, he, he uh, worked directly with those New Testament prophets and apostles. If you wanted to hear the New Testament, you'd have to go to services. You'd have to hear a prophet or an apostle. Every apostle was a walking New Testament. I was in a debate years ago with a man named Rubel Shelley in 1991 in Memphis. And Rubel said that since the early church didn't have all the truth, there wasn't any pattern for us in the New Testament. I took exception to that and stood up and said on the day of Pentecost, the early church had an Old Testament and, he, and 12 translations of the New Testament. Amen. 12 apostles who all, each one could speak a language of the people to whom he was speaking. So they had a whole Bible. Anywhere an apostle went, you had a whole Bible. I showed you this morning that they knew more than they wrote. They knew more than they wrote. And when Peter said, God has given us all things, he didn't say he will give. He said he has given, even before he wrote it. When they went out and preached, they preached the whole counsel of God, Acts chapter 20. No New Testament in print, but in the human vessels, 2 Corinthians 4, 7. And so, they walked in the fear of the Lord and the comfort, but notice what the Word will do. Comfort one another with these words. How does the Holy Spirit comfort me? Through His message. Whenever I feel that I'm not understanding God's love, I read the book of Hosea. What a great encouragement that is. If God could love Israel, even through all of that, he could, He'll surely love me. The Word and the Spirit give love. Well, whoso keepeth His Word, in Him verily is the love of God perfected, hereby know that we are on Him, are in Him. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed in abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. Again, that's done through the message. I love the first part of Romans 5, 5. This hope we have of heaven, we shouldn't be confused about that. That word of shame means confused. I'm not confused about that at all. I know that God loves me. I know that He has a place for me to go. Last year at our lectureship, we talked about build your hopes on things eternal. What a great thought. The love of God. I wish I could stand here for eight hours and talk about the love of God. I don't, I don't understand all of it. I have two sons. I doubt if I'd give you one. He only had one son. Hard to fathom that gift. Hard to understand that. Well, where did I learn about all that? From my Bible. From my Bible. The Word and the Spirit wash us. And such were some of you, but you are washed, sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. How's that done, Paul? That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by 
the Word. Very simple. When I was baptized, I did what the Word told me to do. And I was washed. I can remember that day as if it were yesterday. I remember what it was like. But I have to ask all of you a question if you'll listen carefully. Would someone come to me after the services and tell me what's wrong with my Christianity? I would really like to know. Because in 52, 53 years now of being a Christian, I've never felt someone enter my body. I've never had a nudge, a secret voice, a feeling. The only thing I received when I was baptized was a towel. What happened? Either we misunderstood what Acts 2.38 is, and if you'll come back at 6 o'clock tonight, we'll talk about that. Or somebody's teaching something that's wrong. Or there's something wrong with my Christianity. But what I'm showing you now is how I learned about the Christ and the Holy Spirit and the Father. What I'm showing you now is all of that came from the Word of God, folks. And this is the Word which by the Gospel is preached unto us. Holy Spirit and the Word wash. They also save. Suppose said to save. Well, we just read 1 Corinthians 6, 11, but look at Acts 11, 14. Peter, when you get to the house of Cornelius, you tell him words, whereby all he and all his household shall be saved. You know, the Holy Spirit appeared at Cornelius' house. Gave that whole group of Gentiles the gift of tongues. And they weren't even saved. Why did he appear? Because tongues are assigned to unbelievers. 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Well, who were the unbelievers? Not, he's not talking about the Gentiles who weren't yet Christians. He's talking about the Jews who were now Christians, represented by Peter, who had the thought that the Gentile doesn't belong in the church. But when Peter saw them get that gift from the Holy Spirit, he said, Can any man forbid water that these should be, not be baptized as well as we? The unbelievers in that house at that moment were the Jews who had become Christians who had a problem with the Gentile coming in the church. And so God corrected that because He had made a promise to the Gentiles a long time ago that in Abraham's seed all the families of the earth would be blessed, Genesis 12, 3. And so it is that when he got to Cornelius' house, the way Cornelius was saved was not by that power of the Holy Spirit. He was saved by words that Peter taught him. And then Cornelius and his household were baptized for the remission of their sins. The Word and the Spirit sanctify. In his high priestly prayer, Jesus said, Father, sanctify them through the truth. Thy Word is truth. The word sanctify means to set apart. I'm set apart from the world. I'm set apart from evil. I'm set apart from all that's ugly in this world. I'm in Christ. So I'm sanctified. That is, I'm set apart. Sanctified does not mean sinlessly perfect. It means I'm forgiven and set apart. And, but that is also said to be done through sanctification of the Spirit. Well, the Word sanctifies. The Spirit sanctifies. Are you getting the point? They make us free, the Word and the Spirit do. Said Jesus to those Jews that believed on Him, if you continue in My Word. I may have told you this before. If I did, I'm going to tell you again. When I was in the United States Navy, I met a little red-headed girl. And she begged me to marry her, so I did. If I want her to know I said that, I'll tell her. No, I think I asked her. Four months after we were married, the United States Navy sent me to Adak, Alaska by myself. For 13 months, 27 days, 11 hours and 17 minutes, till I saw her. Dorothy wrote me twice a day the whole time I was there. In fact, I got so many letters that I went to the base carpenter and I said, could you make me a shelf? He said, why? I said, I got all these letters from my wife and I need some t place to store them and so I have a convenient time to read them. You believe that? 
I don't either. That's two lies I've told today. I ripped those letters open the moment I got them. Read and reread and read and reread. Why? Now tell yourself why you don't study this word. You have to love the one that wrote it. Amen. The Word and the Spirit make us free, but we need to continue in it. That's how we do it. That's how we're built up. People who don't study the Bible are like an electric lamp plugged without a plug. They're not plugged in anything. There's no source, no light. We have to understand that. If you're looking for God beyond the sacred page, He's not there. You're going to have to find Him in the Word. The Word and the Spirit convert. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And then the Comforter came, of course, to guide them into all truth so that we could be converted. Let's look at these two passages. For almost 200 years, the brethren have noted the connection in these two passages. This particular passage has been, two passages have been used over and over again over the years in debate with Pentecostal folks and folks who believe in a direct leading of the Holy Spirit to show them something. In Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, we're told, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That's a command. Be filled with the Spirit. But notice the connection to the singing. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart, to the Lord. Uh, for those of you who wonder why we don't use an instrument, this is the verse. This verse says to sing, not play. The instrument on which we're to play is in the verse. We make melody in our hearts. We pluck our heartstrings. It comes from the heart of man, this singing. But notice the cross reference in Colossians 3.16. Be filled with the Spirit. How do I do that, Paul? Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. This living message, this seed, lives in me. I tell my students all the time that I now dwell in them. Because some of them will remember some of the things I taught them. And I will dwell in them. Did you know that you and I dwell in God? 1 John 4. Did you know that God the Father dwells in us? 1 John 4. Did you know that you and I walk in Christ? Galatians 3.27 Did you know that Christ is in us, the hope of glory? The Colossian letter tells us. Did you know that the Holy Spirit dwells in us, but that we walk in the Spirit? None of that's literal. That's all to do with being a Christian. And so what do we do? We let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. There's no mystery here. And I wish we could get rid of the voodooism that I hear sometimes about this subject. There's no mystery. It's all ways of saying, I'm a Christian. I love this. The Word and the Holy Spirit strengthen us. That He will grant you according to the riches of His glory, watch now, to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. Why? Next verse says that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith. That verse tells us how it's done. By faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So whatever the Holy Spirit is said to do, the Word is said to do. If, they, if the Old Testament characters had kept the commands of God, he would have, that it would have made them strong. In fact, he told Joshua when Joshua took over the leadership, be strong and of good courage. How do you do that? I wanna, want to um, prick your hearts a little bit. That's not what I want to do. I want you to be curious about what I'm going to say tonight. So I want to ask you a question. Have you ever heard the prayer, Father, give that preacher a ready recollection of the things he's been studying? You ever heard that? I want you to tell me how God's going to do that. I'll talk about that tonight. We have some strange ideas that we don't even think about sometimes. But they're all Calvinistically based, and that's what I want to talk about tonight. The Word and the Spirit lead us. The Word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. How is that done? Through the message. 
The word and the Spirit witness, wherefore the Holy Spirit is a witness to us after that he had said before. Look at Revelation 2 and 3 with me for just a moment. You want to know how the Holy Spirit speaks to churches? The Revelator tells us. Verse 11, chapter 2, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Again and again in this text, same thing, verse 29. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. This is in an age of inspiration. They still had to find out what he said. This is repeated in chapter 3 over and over again. Verse 13, chapter 3, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. The Holy Spirit was a witness, for after that he had said before. What the Word of God is said to do, the Holy Spirit is said to do. Which, impact, which fact and alone implies that he works through the message. In fact, brothers and sisters, more is said about what the Word does than what the Holy Spirit does. In fact, look at Psalm 138, verse 2 with me. Yeah, I uh, was really taken aback and impressed and privileged and honored to hear Brother Clark pray a moment ago. Brother Clark, I will always remember that. To hear you pray, I felt like I was right in the presence of God. I just knew that. But I also knew that it's the case. What did I call out there? Oh, the 138th Psalm. I knew there was something. Is that in the New Testament? It's in my New Testament. But I was so impressed to hear Brother Clark pray. A godly man praying. But he was praying to the Father up there. Look at Psalm 138 too. I will worship toward thy holy temple. Praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above thy name. When I don't honor the word of God, I'm not honoring God. When I ignore the word of God, I'm ignoring God. When I neglect to study his word, I'm neglecting God. When I hurt my brothers and sisters I'm hurting God and I need to connect my relationship with him to this message it's how he's communicating with us and it's how we know what to do one day to have a complete revelation and a complete fellowship with God Almighty the Word of God is the instrument by which the Holy Spirit activates for the sinner and the saint. That's how it's done. And there isn't any other way to do it. When you closed your Bibles this morning, did it dawn on you that all you ever knew about the Holy Spirit was in the book? That ought to tell you something. Brothers and sisters, I never argue with a man from Scripture about his view of the Holy Spirit. If he believes the Holy Spirit's doing something to him, separate and apart from the Word, why argue the Word with him? So I asked the fellow, what's it feel like in my brain when that happens? Which synapses of the brain does this being touch? What's it feel like when that kind of a being enters your body? Is it warm, cold, what? Are you on fire? And you say, Keith, you're being ridiculous. No, I'm trying to take the voodooism out of this. This is a being who gave us a message, and he put that message in a living seed so that when it's planted in our minds, it grows, and he's activating the growth of it. The Holy Spirit's sword is the Word of God. And that Word says this morning, there was a being, the second person of the Godhead in human flesh. And He came to save you. He died on a cross. He was buried. And three days later, He walked out of that tomb. He, was die he died, he was buried, and three days later was raised. Have you obeyed that? Do you not know that so many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? There's the death. 
Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. There's the burial. That like as Christ was raised from the grave by the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Folks, there's the resurrection. And when you have part in the first resurrection, you never need to fear the second. Maybe there's a Christian here today who needs to come back home. I love the picture of the prodigal son, don't you? It pictures God as moving toward the prodigal as he comes home. If you need to come home this morning, he's waiting. He's got his arms outstretched. He wants you to come while we stand and while we sing.